I never know when it's actually on, so I'll just chit chat for a second to make sure <laughs> that we're ready, but it's starting to go live. Um, so that was fantastic, Lori. I'm just really excited uh, for this presentation, and I'm so glad that you were able to do this. And I'm going to make sure that my uh, YouTube doesn't start talking out loud, hopefully, when I am <laughs> leading it. I'm getting used to yeah, it all. It's good. Well. Yeah, getting it all together. Uh, if nothing, this year we are just learning how to learn things. <laughs> so many things to learn. Uh, but thank you. That was just really eye-opening and wonderful for us to hear and to learn more about. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's here and um, in the Zoom with us, but also those that are watching online. And thank you for spending your evening with us and learning more about this, or whenever it is that you're going to be watching this. Uh, I'm hoping that our group has some questions to ask because there's just so much material here to cover that's really exciting but um i wanted to get the ball rolling up front oh uh, it, i wanted to get the ball rolling up front to talk about um the makeup of your studio now and where you um uh where you've started teaching and what it is you do now like how has your career changed from when you started out as a singer fresh out of college and ready to go um, into how you spend your time these days? Well, it's changed quite a bit, especially now that I am uh, administrator and department chair. Uh, but early on, um, I spent a lot of time with my staff. I was constantly giving extra lessons and um, extra time. I was, you know, putting on opera productions myself, teaching all the music, creating costumes, writing the <laughs> the tracks and 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 things for the wind ensemble. I was doing everything. I was like a one woman show. So um, I had a lot of energy then that I don't have now. <laughs> I um I had to you know figure out a way to do it smarter to uh, get the students the experience I know they would need um, furthering their education etc um, that wouldn't burn me out so I started partnering with the theater department and you know we would do like split shows half of it with theater half of it with opera scenes um, I would rearrange operas like I, I arranged Magic Flute and set it in Harlem and kind of uh, did a modern um, a modern libretto so that it would they could really start to relate to the storyline and they still sang it in the same voicings but you know I had to get really creative with um, my approach with the students and getting them to embrace like why do we need to sing this music <laughs> so um and now as a department chair you know i have to when i first got here i was trying to do everything as well and i had learned very quickly it, you're gonna burn yourself out and actually in all transparency i did end up in the hospital last year from stress so i had to learn very quickly i cannot do you know i i have to lead the faculty to make the same kind of innovative strategies that i had to come up with um so that was a challenge and um it, for pretty much the first two years of me being chair i really um, wasn't able to teach much, but I ended up getting, having a few students. But uh, since the um, pandemic and kind of starting this online studio and, you know, working with anybody that wanted <laughs> help, it's of course grown exponentially. And, um, but again, as, as I said in the presentation, I, I get to kind of work with the people that they're so, uh, not saying the college students aren't appreciative, but, you do know, you know, they kind of feel like, yes, it's a class and this is, you know, so um, when people come from outside and they come with, they've always wanted to take lessons or they've always wanted to be in a master class, I get uh, such appreciation and, and a much more energy to uh, immediately apply, you know, the things that I'm talking about. So um, that, but I did learn from all of that, that, how to articulate the technique in a way that you know anybody could easily grasp i'm still learning to uh tailor that especially as i work with um uh, more and more people outside of just gospel and and r b styles etc so 
it it's changed a lot, but I'm still growing. I'm excited every time I I get a new challenge, and um, I'm looking to implement these kinds of strategies as the department chair. Um, I've been talking to several people about possibly a BA in gospel music or you know uh, music ministry, something that really caters to the kinds of students that um, that we service, but would prepare them. Uh, uh, strategically and technically and all these things for the kinds of careers that we know, um, again, based off of the statistics and the uh, students that I, I work with, they'll be getting jobs in their churches and leading their church ministries. So I want them to be able to do that with as much technique, with as much skill as possible so that they can sing three services. Sometimes my students, you know, I have a student who's minister of music in Chicago and he's got three, well, when we were all together, um, three services back to back. And uh, he would call me several times and be like, Dr. Hicks, I'm so glad you taught me this technique because your other people would go horse and I'm never horse and nothing. <laughs> so, you know, even just those little things where they can come back and say, you know, these techniques made a difference. No, I didn't pursue a uh, career in classical singing or in opera or even in teaching, but I'm, I'm still able to use um, the tips and the, the tools and the techniques that you taught me to further my career in in what I love the most. So that's how I guess that's how it's changed. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I'm really glad that you brought that up about where you got to go where there's a way to make a living and where you can earn money um, doing this, which is important. And when we're dreaming about what it is we want to do, we don't always think about the practicalities of that too. And I think um, in my life experience as a singer too, that it's helpful to be able to evolve like you have evolved. And um, I'm, lots of uh, people I know who are successful in this business are the ones that are open to changing and picking up new skills as we go, even as we get older and older. Um, so I am really appreciative of that mentality that you are demonstrating and such a great role model for your students in that way. Again, um, it was out of necessity, though. I didn't start off that way. I said, this is what I was taught. This is what you're supposed to sing. And they were like, uh, no. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to find another way. So again, out of necessity. But but thank you, though. That's yeah, so well, and part of that is that as you get older, you start to realize, oh, yeah, that really does matter. <laughs> I sometimes tell my students, I've taught you everything you need to know in the first semester. You just weren't listening the first time. <laughs> you know, we said, yeah. uh, but <laughs> Not that I know everything, that's for oh, sure. <laughs> still always learning, always. But. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking about, uh, I know you mentioned uh, that the classical technique is helpful to sustain their voices in this in these other styles too, including gospel. Um, maybe mention a few of those things that you feel that are most important to remember. But then I also want to know if there are important techniques you've learned from singing in other styles that have helped you um, in other in classical style and others as well. Right, right. So I can really relate that back to uh, this side there. Um, this is how I came up with the 5S method and it's breaking down these basics of uh, the basics of classical technique or just technique. Um, so I'm not referring it to classical at all. I don't, you know, because that scares them away, to be frank. Um, so I talk about the importance of support and where the strength of the voice has to come from. So I explain that how just how the body is made and how, you know, the the physics of the voice works. So the more we under, they, they understand that, then they say, OK, then that makes sense. Um, so no matter what genre it is, you need to know the support that you need to be able to sustain what it is you want. And then where does that power or that strength for that genre come from? And it's never going to come, as we know, from the throat or from the chest, but being able to um, channel that energy to get the same resonance or to get the same effect. It, you know, a lot of times it's just a small adjustment in those first two S's, but um, always I'll, I talk about the space and I explain how the voice is shaped. So I, I like to give my example of, um, you know, if the voice is shaped like a bendy straw and I really didn't even plan this. I was just had my bendy straw, 
<laughs> but you know, the voice is shaped like a bendy straw and getting them to understand that, you know, it's flexible, but it can only, you know, be stretched so far out of shape. And then the more you stretch it out of shape, then you really uh, uh, hinder the natural flow of the voice and of the airflow. So I break all those things down. I talk about the smile or the resonance and the mask, and they already in, uh, instinctively do the lift and and have that um, that that inner that outer smile, if you will. Um, so I talk about that. They can relate to that easily. But I also show you know there's different levels to that lift to where you know usually in gospel singing it's a very wide smile and then i just get them to feel that same lift more in the front of the face um so again it's coming it's reverse engineering from what they're used to or what they might uh it naturally gravitate to and then steer them through these methods and then submit is paying attention to how your voice feels because um many gospel singers you know, the the feeling of the tension and the hoarseness is more of a regularity so that they don't see it as an indicator to, you know, slow down, stop, pay attention to what you're doing, relieve the tension. So getting them to understand that, um, getting them to embrace vocal health paying attention to um, what they're they're eating, when they're eating, their water intake, acid reflux, all of that. And then submit is also about the um, understanding of the message that you're getting across. So no matter what style you're singing, our approach to interpretation and communication of the text is still the same. We still don't wanna get up here and sing anything without moving our audiences and communicating um, only as the voice can. So it's it's speaking exercises, it's um, uh, interpretation and phrasing exercises, planning the breaths in their hymns, in their gospel numbers. A lot of times they don't even think about those things. But you know, if you're going to communicate, if I don't know the song and you're going to communicate it um, to where I understand what you're saying, then your articulation. So I talk about diction. And then your um, your phrasing and not breathing in the middle of words. So I sneak that in, uh, that technical approach in, and um, they're able to better communicate. And then they're also thinking about their line. They're also stretching their breath support and going uh, farther in their in their range. So uh, that is, I think that I think I answered your question. <laughs> that is, you know, how I've I've really been able to relate um, all of this to. Uh, what gospel singers in all is singers of all genres. That's been the real um, joy of the master classes. Is I get the whole gamut, um, and also across the overseas as well. So um, it's I've been able to use the same five tactics, the same five approaches with each singer, and I'll say you know bring out more smile or you know focus more on the support. And then uh, with support, I also talk about that mental support or, you know, the negative messaging that we often tell ourselves or we compare ourselves to other singers, etc. So I really try to um, bring it from this holistic support, I mean, holistic approach. So man, no matter what singer is in front of me or speaker, I've been working with preachers as well. That is a lot more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> got more ways to go. <laughs> um, but in, in working with more preachers, I'm studying their approach as well beyond, you know, what I grew up with and, you know, the preachers that I, I watch on Sundays and whatnot. So it, it's still this, this give and take and this this education, but just really learning in every individual's vocal approach and how they view what they're doing with their voice. Because a lot of times we're presenting techniques that take them away from how they see themselves. And that at at the core of them, it's it's going to be very difficult to get someone to embrace um, anything different. I, I remember doing <laughs> this was years ago when I first started doing the Hampton Conference and I did, um, you know, I did my workshop. Mommy's still working. Mommy is still working. OK, <laughs> um, I did my workshop and. Uh, they came in, the, the choir director came in afterward <laughs> and said, all right, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hicks. All right. Now, it was almost like, forget everything she just said, and let's, now let's sing. 
So, you know, it, it, it I, I had to have a come to Jesus moment and collect myself. But I also understood, you know, now I just need y'all to sing. I just need y'all to not be in your heads. Right. Just give your all. But you know, off the coattails of the presentation where I'm like, well, you can do what you're doing with more technique. They're like, okay, now let's sing. So it's, we still have a lot of layers to um, peel away, but to be able to um, really dig into that and say, you know, you can do that this way, try it this way. Do you feel more at relaxed? Do you feel more open? And then they start to feel more e more at ease at what they're doing. So. It's yeah, related to that, we had a question from Linda in the chat, entry points when working with a student, getting that trust and just finding points of common ground, where have you been most successful, repertoire, feeling, technique, common story? The the common story has been the most successful um, and then and then I go from there to feeling. So in choosing repertoire, um, I would often ask, okay, what's your favorite gospel song? Or if they're not big in the gospel, what's your favorite song? Um, and I would try to pull from their style of, of the, what they enjoy singing or what they enjoy listening to. And if it's, you know, something uh, slow and blues and, and things like that, then maybe I'll uh, assign Dido's Lament or, you know, something with that, that uh, angst uh, emotion in it. So I pull from the emotion of, of the songs and the music that they, um, they gravitate, gravitate to naturally. And then I find a classical song or, or a repertoire piece that has that same type of emotion, maybe even that same storyline. Um, and I, I relate it that way. So I spend a lot of time like, um, when I'm talking about the music or talking about the meeting, like if, you know, this were modern day, this is what is happening. You know, there's a girl in love and blah, 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 blah. We can modernize the storyline. Um, and with, so then that leads me then to the technique because then they get to a point where, you know, you really can't sing this music unless you have <laughs> a technical approach and soft palate rays and the mess and the breath support and all of that. So from the feeling of the phrases, from the feeling of the words and from the feeling of the music, I am better able to instruct their technique. So it really is, you know, usually, and, I, and maybe this is just, you know, in my experience, usually we get to the feeling last after we've gotten, you know, the pitches, the rhythms, the, um, the placement and all everything in between. And then we start to add the, um, the feeling and the, uh, all of that. So um, coming, approaching the technique from the feeling. So this is why you need to stretch that phrase because you're saying this and because you feel that way, it, they're just much more easier to um, embrace and, and to um, accept. I hope that answered that. Yeah, Linda, did, did that answer your question? I think so, maybe. You can come off mute. <laughs> yeah, you can come hey, off. Linda, nice to see you. You're on mute. I'll yeah. talk. Oh, yeah, great. Good, good. Please do. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. That sort of feeling. I found that to be true as well, especially with people who are first actors with their voices, you know, and, it, and it's really a wonderful way to work, actually. It really you know, is. It's what got it first. What got me singing really was the feeling. Yeah. And I think we kind of forget that in all of yes. our training, we're, yes. trying to, we're in our heads trying to make sure everything <clears throat> is just right. right. And classical music demands that of us. But um, I've even changed my approach. You know, how do I feel about this piece yes. before I start singing it? And thankfully, I'm to the point where I can, you know, I'm old enough now <laughs> so we can, you know, have make those choices. But um, I did not feel that way coming through my training. I did not feel that I could, you know, make those choices and choose things that would um, exemplify my personality. You know, it was, I have to show my range. I have to show my agility. I have to show, you know, my soft and my, it, it came from, right. I have to show all my techniques. So um, I, I think it has been freeing for my students 
to, you know, and I've had some students, you know, also include blues and in addition to musical theater and and uh, soul music and songs that they've written in their recitals. Um, and I'm like, okay, you just need 30 minutes of standard repertoire. The rest of it, I don't think you do what you do. So it really gives them the platform and the opportunity to try their hand and apply the techniques to the things all, that they would want to go after beyond graduation. I, you know, out of, I would probably only have about 10% of my students that would pursue uh, mm -hmm. graduate study and, and uh, classical performance um, full time, or you know, and the, and the majority would go into teaching, and then the other half would go into um, other styles. So, um, I really wanted to make sure that yeah, they they were equipped with just the foundation of it all, and so that they can apply it to everything. Yes, I think, I think maintaining, as you said in your in your speech, your your program so eloquently through that that time where you're singing for feeling and then you've got to learn how to sing mm -hmm. and it can be a big turnoff mm -hmm. to sing yeah. it again. and then so, with my students they would sneak off like myself and and sing what they wanted to anyway right so then they come back to their lesson horse and i'm like what are you doing yeah i yeah. had to sing at church dr hicks i had to lead the choir i had to do this i had to do that and then eventually i had to get in my head okay they're going to do it anyway what can I do to help them do yep. it and not show up in my lesson and drive me crazy, you know, and, yeah. and undo everything that we've worked on. So yeah, those approaches yeah. like the adding the rhythms and having them, um, I, I would say, well, what song are you planning to sing in church Sunday? And we would work on it together. And I'm like, okay, how you approach that? I said, I want to hear how you would do it as if I'm not here, as if I'm not there <laughs> and go, go for it. And then, um, and I, I want to, you know, see how can you apply better space? How can you use your breath better? How can you um, uh, uh, project through the mask rather than through the throat or through the chest? So, you know, I would put them in the context of what they would be doing and say, anytime you open your mouth, you're representing me. So if you're going to do it anyway, let's figure this thing out. Yeah. yeah. Good advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, very good. Yeah. Um, I think it's good. I think it's important that we address this comment um, about ruining your voice by doing that style, because yeah. um, I think that's been a, a stigma for a long time. And it's sometimes out of fear from the teacher standpoint that I don't know what you're doing. And therefore, it must be wrong because it's not what I know you know to, how to do. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that so that that ex is explained um, and that we're not thinking that gospel ruins your voice because there's clearly singers who've had illustrious and long careers doing healthy singing in this style too. I wonder if you could talk about that. And and it's not uncommon in the HBCUs either. You know, they um, have the concert choir and then they've got the gospel ensemble and often it is law in handbook that if you are in concert choir, if you are a voice major, you are forbidden from singing in gospel ensembles. So it has been this rift and where gospel singers have had to figure it out and, and, and you know, they've just done what felt good or what was moving. And um, the perception or that stigma um, really came from as more and more black singers became educated and, um, and were trained it was, you know, it, there was no one who was teaching both. There was no approach that, you know, and, and just from studying a uh, voice in general, everything was according to this style. So um, I, I even venture to say no other style really had a connection to the classical training. So um, as you come up and as you're, you know, going through, well, I, I'm studying, I'm in college now, and uh, now I have to learn these songs. It was the way gospel was sung. Yes, you could ruin your voice because again, you're going back and forth and you're not applying anything that, and you're not allowed to apply anything that you're learning to what you're doing um, when you're going to your churches or when you're singing gospel. So 
um, the more and more I learn to, again, allow that space, that safe space for them to figure it out, for them to be able to apply those techniques, then I took away, for at least uh, for me and my students, that stigma that you can't, because they would tell us, oh, once you learn this technique, you can sing anything. Not really if I haven't, you know, figured out the style, if I haven't figured out how to apply it. Um, so it did, yes, allow me to be able to sing everything else from a healthier standpoint, but it also stripped away from the style. But what you're seeing now with a lot of singers who've kind of come full circle is you're seeing uh, the most, uh, the best of all the worlds um, because we no longer, you know, have to sing certain songs and we're, we're having to figure it out in the world. So um, there was a singer, ah, now his name escapes me, but he did a, a concert, um, a Christmas concert, uh, and he went from classical to jazz, to blues, to musical theater, to hip hop, to rap, to uh, gospel, to, I mean, he did all of it. And um, one thing that I really appreciated was I, you could tell he was a classically trained tenor, fabulous sound, but he was able to manipulate that and tailor it for every single style he did. And he was authentic to that style. And I just really sat in awe at just how, you know, unapologetic he was about it and, you know, confident he was in doing all of these styles his way and that is what i envision really for vocal training and the undergraduate level because to me studying classical and opera is like training for the olympics so you know when gymnast gymnasts or you know athletes are first starting off yes they might have the olympics in mind but it takes you know years and years for them to develop those fundamental skills so if we can kind of approach it like um, actors who who study acting by developing character gestures, you know, they study the fundamentals and then they learn how to apply it in Shakespearean plays, in modern plays, in, you know, all the different styles. So I envision, you know, a world where we just approach vocal training to at least on the undergraduate level to where you're getting the fundamentals and you're learning how to um, how to match pitch, how to do your rhythm, how to support your breath, how to, you know, stretch your range and all of these things. And then you learn how to apply it in all the different styles that you would come across. And then, you know, if you want to go the extra mile and you want to go shoot for the Olympics, by all means, graduate school, young artist programs, you know, all of that. Um, but it really takes a focus that I think, for, at least for my students, they weren't prepared to embrace all of that starting off and they didn't come from backgrounds where they were singing these songs in high school um and learning you know we were learning teaching theory for the first time many times so um it i really just had to open this my my mind and open the the landscape of what i was preparing them for and how they could use their vocal technique for all of it no matter what they wanted to do wonderful um, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I my perception is that uh, this tradition, a gospel in particular, is a lot about learning by rote or through listening um, from very early ages, oftentimes, and coming up through the church. Um, I wonder if you would speak about transitioning from the the listening brain to the reading brain and um, coping mechanisms between those, because those are two halves of the brain that sometimes. Um, are in disagreement with each other and it's a difficult shift for some people. Yes. Um, early on, that was very difficult for me. And as I started to figure out, okay, they, they know their pitches. And then another thing I realized is they do a lot of this while they're singing. So there is, there is a tactile, if you will, relationship. So then I started having them do that on the keyboard and figure out, okay, what is your vocal line doing? Uh, what, are you, what are you doing with your voice? And then how does that translate to on the scale? Um, and then they could figure out the rhythms um, with, their sheet, with their repertoire and with their music. I always had them start off clapping the rhythm. I mean, we, fundamental. Clap your rhythm. If you don't know what this is, write down one beat, two beats, half a beat, write it in there. Um, if there, I had students who had trouble, you know, 
uh, when the note goes up, they will go down. Okay, I know you can hear this pitch because when I play it or when I sing it, you can sing it back. So you need to relate, okay, draw an arrow up. So that, I mean, some very simple, it, it was very tedious and time consuming, but it really, um, I equate it to, you know, cutting my child's food up in tiny little bits um, instead of just handing them a whole steak dinner and everything, you know, okay, here's, here's the rhythm bit. All right. Where here's the, the melody bit here is um, you know, don't even think about the French. Don't even think about German yet. You wait for me. <laughs> and, you know, speaking their text uh, just by itself, excuse me, speaking their text by itself um, so they could get used to the inflection. Um, all of those things, I mean, it was very piece by piece. So that for me was the transition into them recognizing what they were reading and what they were seeing. And then eventually they got more and more independent. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of the spoon feeding, if you will, early on, and then they got used to it and they were able to, you know, digest it themselves. And, and what about going the other way too? Because oftentimes you have people come up the other direction where they're relying on reading a lot and the rhythm is just a, a hard thing to comprehend with the movement and um, that I wonder if you have much experience with that people wanting to learn gospel style or from the other way. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but from the other way, I guess it would be, um, I would probably strip the music away and and do more rote. Uh, with that so they could relate to the music in more of a feeling and more of that that um that organic approach um i am i probably shouldn't say it yet but i am working on uh, a book with a colleague of mine where we're scoring out gospel riffs and runs to you know give context to the things that are um uh, uh, standard um, embellishments and things like that, kind of like the Ricci books for gospel, <laughs> gospel music. Um, so being able to then, if you're learning it as a style, if you're learning it as patterns, because these are patterns that we just happen to grow up with. And then, you know, it might seem like, oh, they just threw that in there, but they've done that run or that riff in all, you know, just about everything they've done, but it, these become patterns that we're used to. So learning the patterns, um, and then learning, it, yeah, if you're just wanting to get the, the rhythmic style, there are rhythmic patterns that you would, um, that you would gravitate to, but you know, it is like the same, you would do a lot more listening than we, we would assign our students, um, learning classical rep. It is a lot more about that imitation and, and learning the style from by rote. Yeah. Yeah. Listening and, and, um, imitating but also shifting your hierarchy of what elements of music are more important i think mm -hmm. between the different styles yeah. yeah and if if the approach is um more is a spread tone you know if you're 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 playing around with different colors in your tone um that is also another stylistic thing because you could see a gospel singer go from ah I mean, they'll go through the whole vocal <laughs> spectrum yeah. and all the colors, but it is really about experimentation, um, freeing up the, the, the lines and the confines of how a tone should be and being able to see, can I apply, you know, support and space and, and range and all of that to all these other different colors and, and textures. Great. Uh, we've been getting some nice comments. Uh, Gregory Gardner says that he had to leave, but he wanted to convey his hellos to you. And uh, also Rena Lucas commented, I love connecting the emotions and styles from other genres that resonates to classical pieces with some of these same feelings, etc. Wonderful. So it's really speaking with um, and Kathleen Bell made a comment, I think all higher education should go in that direction. And I Kathleen, was that in reference to um, uh, shifting the learning. Whoops, you yeah. yeah, I I'm I'm so loving this conversation first because I think it's so important um on multiple levels. And so I, I wasn't expecting to say anything live. I get nervous. But what I what I meant was that um 
I feel like we're shifting from being teacher centric education to student centric education. And that is everything, you know, um, back, back in the old days to hear um, an opera or to hear classical music, you either had to travel really far or um, you just didn't, you, it was like so hard to get access. And now with YouTube and everything, my classical students learn by rote, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I try to tell them, Please don't do that because you're going to learn other people's mistakes so you're going to learn their interpretation but you know that's how we learn language yeah. first we don't we don't come out of the womb and learn how to speak english by writing it mm -hmm. or reading it we we learn it by listening and um so i i think it's so beautiful that you are you're speaking my heart um dr hicks yeah. <laughs> about education and i think um that every art form has value and should be respected and celebrated mm -hmm. and i think if higher education goes this route then we will we will actually like help education survive if that makes sense yes it does we we will become obsolete if we don't make these adjustments and cater to what the students really want um, and I, I do tell my students, I said, singing came first, then came the training and the study and all of that. Um, so the music is still the music um, and, and we can apply training and study to it, but we still have to, at the core of us are at the, um, at, at, we just want to communicate. We just want to share music. Um, so yeah, being able to get beyond that, has been has been my mission where my students feel uh they feel like they belong and they feel like i had a student learn cardo nome completely by rote and i was thinking the same thing like oh god oh god but when she came in and i mean whatever pitches might have been out of place okay let's take this slowly but she had the pattern i mean she had the gist of it and then we worked it in reverse so it really it really did help her to be able to um uh, grasp that whole aria and she enjoyed listening to it so much. I said, okay, go ahead. Fine. <laughs> well, if you think about it, I mean, the music is just there to teach us in our ear because our ear needs to know where we're going in order to do anything in yeah. the first place. So it, we should have a high respect for people who have a highly attuned ear. It's a very important skill and crucial to the language, I think. And, and when people come from the gospel backgrounds and they, they learn everything by rote and, and they have that ear, um, many times they're, um, it's taken away from it. It's taught out of them because they're like, well, you, you can't get a job or you can't uh, be a real musician. People have been telling students that you can't be a real musician if you don't read music. Um, and, you know, going to certain conferences and things like that, you hear more and more people where um, they're famous artists, but, you know, they weren't able to get the kind of training that they desired because their natural ear was not appreciated and they struggled. Nobody would, well, you know, you have to learn this um, this way and they wouldn't connect the dots for the students. So, um, and I'm not a theorist. I, I don't really don't have any tips on how to connect the dots, but I really pay attention to, okay, how are you processing this? How are you, um, how do you think about this music? And then how can we, um, if they play what they're doing in a MIDI keyboard and they see it, then you've just composed a piece or you've just, you know, you just see in real time what it is you're doing naturally. So that's another bit of that reverse engineering. I, I think it's also so important because um, uh, music shouldn't be for the elite mm -hmm. and, you know, beauty should be available to all and and I the work that you're doing of infusing um, someone's own language with the language of Bellini or the language of, mm -hmm. you know, don't it's, I mean, it's just, it's so wonderful and I, I think we need to have a special conference on this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, the the vocal technique is for everyone. And you know, we there was a time, yes, we cringe when we hear singers or watch American Idol or watch these other shows and things like that. And instead of cringing, I want to be a part of, okay, how can we change that that um standard? How can we raise that, elevate that standard to where, you know, the singers that we love to hear, the popular singers aren't having to get surgery and they're not having to go through, you know, or cancel shows and things like that. We can be the the leaders in that industry and really change it to be the sounds that we can <laughs> we can enjoy. Because when I hear someone, I'm like, oh, don't you feel that? And they <laughs> they don't even know enough to say, okay, this is damaging to this, you know, delicate uh, instrument. So we could be the ones that that could change that whole perspective and they could do what they love to do, but just do it with a little bit more support and a little bit more space and all the S's. <laughs> do you think that in the style that there are sometimes um, encouragement to go to the nth degree, like go to the 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 screamiest scream in order to show you're the most passionate about it um and that there's that that is valued by some and maybe mocked if you are too careful and i wonder if you wanted to address that or not that's a hot potato maybe <laughs> the uh, a, a common thought in uh with gospel singers is if you ain't horse you didn't give god your all and I love God. I love, I love to praise him, but he did not give me a gift for me to bang it against the wall and, you know, gamble with it. And it, it is a, a, a hard sell sometimes, but I really, I come, I use scripture in my um, presentation. <laughs> I use parables. I really try to speak. I do again and again. I come up in the church, but I really focus on speaking their language. And uh, uh, the analogy again: if if um I, I gave my son a very expensive gift, and he started banging it, and and you know uh, just using it any kind of way, of course my reaction would be like, "Oh, you're ruining the gift." So you know, um, again, using a lot of scripture, using a lot of spiritual. Um, uh, men metaphors, I guess, to relate um, giving God, that's why I called my workshop your highest praise. So study to show thyself approved and, and take the time to learn um, the skills that will enhance your praise to God. Um, you don't want to, to uh, learn from a preacher who doesn't study the word. And this vocal technique and being able to use our voices over and over and over again without damage is our Bible, is our our word. So just it, it, it does take a lot of chipping away to get to that. But thankfully, at least when I go to Hampton, they're used to me um, and they know I I come in peace. I come in love and I come with appreciation for what they do because I want to hear you. I, I want to hear you do what you do. I want the power. I want the range. I love it. The, and I call the squalls and the squawks, the that's like the sprinkles on the cake, but you can't make a whole cake out of sprinkles. You know, you have to have the the foundation. You have to have all the ingredients. And then we have the, the sprinkles here and there that won't, and we're not using it to the point where it, you know, starts to cause damage. So I'm not saying don't do it. I never tell them not to do it. I'm like, okay, be smart to choose when you do it to elevate the message or to, you know, um, enhance the message. But if that's your style, I probably won't, you probably won't have a voice for second service. And they know it's true because they don't. So, you know, really, again, speaking the language and saying, okay, if you want to be able to give this service, um, however many services you have, or if you're on tour, or if you're recording, um, recording sessions are very strenuous uh, for gospel singers if you're not um, uh, mindful of your approach because you're singing it over and over and over again, and then you have to lay the tracks, all those things. So yeah it, it takes some chipping away but um if, if they trust me if they trust you um then they'll trust that y you want to enhance again enhance what they're doing and not not strip away and not change who they are at their core yes and he does call us to be excellent at what we do and being excellent is preserving and taking care of what you're doing as well yeah it is 
It is tough. I've he heard that before as well. Um, of course, you didn't give them your all. Like, um, yeah, <laughs> you, you gave it all. You gave it all. Yeah, you gave it all. Go ahead. <laughs> Polly, did you have a question? Were you raising your hand? Hi, this is so wonderful. I'm really enjoying this. And I just kind of wanted to share my experience. So I went um, to a college as an undergraduate and there was a wonderful group of students from Eastern High School or Eastern High School who had come, black students who came and they were in my choir. And then I proceeded to join the chapel choir where they sang. And so here they were singing all these choral things with me. And then I went to the chapel choir rehearsal and I was stunned that they were making all these awesome sounds. And I was like, why don't I know how to do this? I like really I was disturbed and I you know you imitate you start to learn and we learned by ear and I feel like that was one of the most um, transformational informative times of my life and it started me on a trajectory toward exactly what you're talking about helping people to understand how to use the instrument that God gave them yeah. um, in the way that they want to do that and I it it was a huge thing in my life and I felt like they sang it more skillfully in some ways than I did because I hadn't been exposed to that. And so knowing both and understanding the what's possible from the voice, I think is miraculous. And not to know that is almost a disadvantage, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So anyways, I'm thrilled to hear you talk and to encourage and say thank you for what you're doing. And I'm totally there with you. I This is great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and it's yeah. hard to even acclimate to, you know, the other, the gospel singing, because we're used to not feeling anything. It's like, okay, as soon as we feel something, that's when we know we shut that down. But um, you almost have to let all of that go so that you can find that balance of the power with the approach that that we're so used to or you know knowing that our breaths are supported knowing that you know we're not constricting the pathway all of those things the soft palate is still raised but we still gotta get that ah! so you know it, just learning how to again experiment and explore all the spaces all all the sound all the body and it really truly is full body singing um and then getting really focusing my students to to kind of switch that turn that power beneath below because they're used to that power being up here so if you can just shift it to a, an area where it it is coming from the depths coming from the groin i'm like bring it yeah all of that so um it, it's the same thing it's just redistributed and balanced out really so yeah, I'm I'm glad you're you're into the, you're doing that and exploring for yourself. And so yeah, I think we can change the game, and and if we uh, you know have the approach that embraces everybody's style, um, because everybody needs to support the breath. Everybody needs space. Everybody needs you know the placement and all those things. No matter what style you're singing, so it really is um, transitional. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's really wonderful because it's it's like you are fluent in multiple languages too. I mean, that kind of um, ability to shift back and forth, and that just takes so much brain space to figure out um, how not to do really because we learn diction, we learn That's true. IPA. That's true. So really, what I'm talking about is let's learn the IPA of singing, and then we can learn we can sing all the language. We can apply it to all the languages. That's I just wonderful. came up with that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Trademark and trademark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really great. Um, oh yeah, Deborah, do you, are you clapping or do you have a question? Oh, thanks, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the clap. Thank you. Whoops, you're muted. Oh, on mute. Ah, oh, come on. Uh, I forgive me. I it was just not a. I was dealing with two festivals here in the last few days, so, so I'm forgive <laughs> well, me thank for, you for missing being here. Yeah. Well, I just thought I'd slip in. Um, but what I'm hearing is great because I I teach in a very diverse university, mm -hmm. and I, of course I have all kinds of uh, gospel singers and and contemporary Christians. We're we're Washington Adventist University, so we're the Seventh Day Adventist tradition. Yes. So we we have a huge body of of singers who come from that, that ilk and from that um, 
denomination and uh, among others, among other, we have many other students too. So thank you for, I, I uh, 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 Jill, is this gonna, is her uh, talk gonna be available to us, I hope? Yes, it's still there. And this talk that we've just had is is live streaming right now and oh, will great. remain on our web, on our YouTube page. Awesome. So. I, I promise to look into it because it sounds so lovely. Thank you. Thank you for all. I, I know it was wonderful. Forgive me for just no, slipping no, in the door. At the end. <laughs> thank you for talking. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I know it has been an, an incredibly busy time. For all yes, time. yes. <laughs> yeah. Did we have any other questions from the uh, the group here today before we wrap things up? Just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask questions. Um, well, you've given us so much to think about, and I just really appreciate your time, Lori. And it's, you're just so approachable and um, full of great ideas. And I've been really enjoying your Sunday warm ups, and, and and thankfully I can try them in the privacy of my own home because I don't have all the dance knowledge that I can use that other people do. Have fun. Just I got like three moves, them. and that's it. Yeah, yeah, just have fun with them. Yeah, but they are really fun. And I encourage everyone to check her out and follow her on Facebook too. And you can do those gospel warmups with her and um, check in on her master classes as well. Um, but I know you have some things coming up too that other um, online things that maybe our audience would like to hear about. Do you want to tell us what's up next for you? Yes. Um, next is, well, this weekend, I'm the vocal director for The Wiz. Um, production in Clubhouse. I don't know if you're familiar with the Clubhouse app. It's a brand new um, app for iPhones only. Yeah, and it's all audio. And it's really kind of for uh, group discussion, panel discussions in different industries talk, but people have started putting on audio uh, musicals, audio productions. And I got was asked to um, be the vocal director for The Wiz. And it that goes up this weekend. And let's see, I'll give you uh, the, the wizch.com and you can go there for more information We've got a wonderful cast and um i'm also um doing a summit for black women composers and you can that will be march 26 through 28 it's a virtual summit uh women composers.com and that will uh, be panel discussions of eight wonderful uh, Black women composers in the vocal. I'm focusing on vocal music for this summit. Uh, so choral music, uh, solo works. And um, so Friday will be panel discussions and that will run all day Friday. Saturday will be a choral reading session. There'll be research um, panel uh, presentations, excuse me, and dissertations on Black women composers. So you can learn more about, you know, just overall. And then Sunday will be like the recital day. So a compilation, compilation of video recordings of um, performers performing uh, works of Black women composers so wanting to get more exposure for these works um, and uh, get this music out here so people can start programming it and but it, a lot of times it's just hard to find you know get access to it so just bring it all together and it will uh, stream all weekend and then you can get replays uh, for that week so that information you can go to that uh, registration hasn't started yet but it will be up um, is that also my Facebook page is Dr. Lori Hicks or at Dr. Hicks music is my Instagram. And then I have a, you know, a Facebook music page, but Dr. Lori Hicks is like me personally. So I, I post more on Dr. H Lori Hicks and you'll see, you know, pictures of my son and stuff like that. So, um, and then every day this month I'm doing, um, a, uh, uh, a bio of a historical black woman composer um, in giving information about them. And I'm on day 11 now, cause I started on day one. And um, I was just overjoyed to know that I could find enough information to, you know, go for every day and then some. So um, it's been really exciting. I'm learning so much because you, I don't know if any of you know, I'm a composer as well. Um, and I do, I do a lot of spiritual arrangements. My website is lchstudios.com. 
So if you're looking for spiritual uh, solo voice spirituals, I have that there for download. Uh, my album is up there as well for download. You can see the gospel vocal exercises there. Those are all on my YouTube channel. Uh, the master classes are there. Um, I did a vocal. I, I did a singing spirituals master class last month. Um, so I'll be making that available as well. So I'm just. I've been very busy <laughs> while running <laughs> a department. <laughs> yeah, so indeed, indeed. Well, we are so glad that you took time to be with us this week. And we just want to thank you very much for your your work tonight, this great conversation, and also earlier in the week. So we appreciate you very much, Lori. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank all. you all thank for coming you. tonight. Yes, thank you for coming and have a great night. Excellent. Bye. Good night. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.